Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, as Gela said, uh, I spent a month in Australia with my friend Chris and Avian Discovery Tours. Originally, it was, it was supposed to be up to eight participants, but we were the only two that showed up. So it en ended up being a private tour. And this was in September of 2016. Uh, it, was, it was a fabulous tour. It was actually, instead of being hot and dry, like you expect Australia to be, it was actually rain, raining a good deal of the time and cold. So there were a few places we did get rained out of, but we still managed to see quite a bit. And uh, worldwide, there are close to 400 species of parrots. And Australia has anywhere between 53 and 56, depending on whether you're lumping and splitting. And we saw about half those. So it was, it was a great trip and all. And to give you an idea of where we go, this is Australia. Australia is about the same size as the US, but we have about 330 million people and they have 25 million people, mostly concentrated on the coast. So we flew into Sydney and then immediately flew out to Alice Springs. And we spent about a week in this area right here. Then, oops, then we flew to Brisbane and immediately flew out to Southwest Queensland. This is Queensland. This is North, Northern Territories. Then we, we flew into a little tiny airport and then drove and ended up in this corner here. We spent about a week there. Flew back to Brisbane, went up to Cairns, uh, spent one day on the Barrier Reef and then spent about a week in this area up in here. Flew down to Adelaide in South Australia and then spent a week in this area in South Australia and uh, Victoria exploring. Went back to Ad Adelaide, flew to Sydney, spent one day there and went home. So it was basically divided into pretty much four sections. Uh, and we, oh, when we were in Brisbane, we also spent um, a few days down in this area too. So we covered a good deal of the Eastern part of Australia. We didn't get to Western Australia because obviously covering the whole country would be uh, take a lot more than four weeks. Also didn't get up into the Darwin area or down to Tasmania. So starting off in Alice Springs, this was the very first bird we saw. Not a great picture, but I thought it was very fitting that the first bird was a gala, also known in the US as a rose-breasted cockatoo, because both Chris and I have them. And anyone who tuned in early, I brought Rosie over to say hello. But so we were very happy this was the very first parrot we saw. Next parrot is something called the Australian ringneck, not to be confused with the, uh, what's it, the, uh, the, uh, forget the name of the, the other ringneck, <laughs> I want to say Indonesian. Indian ringneck? The Indian, Indian ringneck. Ring uh, these are totally different species. Uh, the Australian ringneck has four subspecies, two in the east and two in the west, and we saw both ones in the east. And this first one is called the Port Lincoln ring neck. And the coloring is very actually quite different between this and the others. And that is actually a packet of sugar in its mouth. Hmm. So um, they have these in downtown Alice Springs, which is a small city, they have these sidewalk cafes and the birds will just come down and, and nick things. And one of the things they love to nick are these little packets of sugar, which obviously are not good for it, but go, go tell that to the parrot. And this is what they do. They take it up into the trees and then they chew open the ends and suck out the sugar. And of course, probably most of it ends up on the ground below. So, But of course, once they do it, you, you can't really teach them not to do it because they're wild birds. And they fly down to the tables and they pretty much grab everything, just like our parrots at home. So in the lower right here, you'll see it, it grabbed a cracker off the table. If you've ever been to the Caribbean, this is a very common experience there too, where the birds just fly down and start eating whatever you have on the table. They also do put up food for them in these little containers, uh, real parrot food, but, and, and they do eat that, but obviously they want the stuff on the table. And as you can see, this is, this is just a stunningly beautiful bird. This is one eating what they're actually supposed to eat, which is a little vegetation. And pretty much most, if not all, of the parrots in Australia are ground feeders. And they're eating shoots and seeds and little fresh greens.
And if you're a bird watcher, one, one thing that's a little frustrating about Australia is that other than the odd pigeon or house sparrow, you don't know any of the species and you don't know any of the songs. So when you hear birds singing, guaranteed you will not know any of the songs. Being September, that's breeding season in Australia, so we saw a lot of this, different species. And then galahs, lots of galahs. Uh, they are sexually dimorphic in that their eyes are different color. So the males have black eyes and the females have light colored eyes. And when they get older, they have those little bumps around their eyes, which is interesting because my Rosie's eyes are dark, but she is was sexed to be female and she doesn't have the bumps. And nobody I know who has a gla has one that has the bumps. So we're thinking maybe it was bred out of them or it was... Most likely, maybe there's a subspecies somewhere in Australia that the, the breeding stock came from. And so here's a female. You can see the contrast in the eyes. And of course, they're feeding on the ground, eating all those wonderful little green things. And these two up here are juveniles. You can tell because they have a lot of gray in their chest. And I think this is dad here. This was at the place we're staying in the yard. They, they set up a few feeders. Okay, budgies. So you've probably all seen all those videos of thousands of budgies flying and these murmurations and flying down to water holes and lifting off and everything. And we did actually see a very small flock fly in front of the car once, but it, it was so quick you couldn't make out the birds, just a flash of green. Well, other than that, this is the budgie we saw for the entire trip, this one male budgie. Um, and we think the reason we didn't see more is because normally you go to bird at the water holes. It's the water's uh, hard to find there. So if you go to the known permanent water holes, then you can find a lot of birds. But it was raining so heavily for so long that there was water everywhere. So the birds didn't need to gather at a watering hole. They could just get their water wherever they wanted. So we, we hung out with this guy a while. And as I said, it turned out to be the only budgie we, we got to interact with. Uh, obviously a male because the sear is blue. Uh, and the wild budgies are green and yellow. So the budgies you see in captivity are all different colors, but in the wild, they're only green and yellow. And either they have a blue sear or a cream colored sear. We think there was probably a nest nearby uh, with a female, maybe some eggs or chicks, but we never found it. And watch what his eyes do at the end. Look, look how pinning they are. Uh, it was very, very windy. So you'll hear, even with the wind setting on my camera, you'll just, you'll hear a lot of wind, unfortunately. Very handsome fellow though. It's such a pleasure to see budgies out in the wild. This is a terrible picture, but it was the only picture I could get of the sp splendid fairy wren. Fairy wrens are these little birds that are just gorgeous. And to me, this is the prettiest one because this is a breeding male and he's just this electric blue. You'll see pictures later of the superb fairy wren. I have a lot of trouble keeping the names apart because one is splendid and one is superb, which to me are basically the same thing. So it's hard to remember which name goes with which bird. Okay, this is something called a patty melon, not to be confused with the marsupial, also called patty melon, but spelled very differently. This is an invasive plant. It's all over the place. The birds and the animals all love these. Uh, you might guess looking at it, it's actually in the watermelon family. It looks delicious, but it turns out it's very astringent and bitter. Uh, our guide broke one open. Uh, I had to, had to taste it. And yes, it is as bad tasting as you can imagine. Uh, I mean, I guess if you were lost in the outback and this was the only thing you could find, uh, you'd probably eat it anyhow, regardless of taste. But it, it looks like it should taste really good. So it's, it's a bit disappointing. 
This is a zebra finch, a bird that in the US we're used to seeing in aviaries, but it is a wild bird in Australia. And there was a whole flock of them that would hang out at the place we were staying. It's a female, another female, the beautiful male with all its coloration. And they were just delightful birds. I could sit there and watch them for hours. All right, so the flora in Australia is stunning. I mean, there are just so many things you've never seen before. Brightly colored flowers and trees and things. This is the only one I include in the talk because it is just so stupendous, I couldn't ignore it. This is called Sturt's Desert Pea. It's in the pea family. And this was something I'd seen ahead of time in videos and I so badly want to see. I was very happy to just find a, a small patch of them on the side of the road uh, in a, sort of a suburban area. And they're about the size of each one of these, this whole unit is about the size of a fist. So they're pretty large. Uh, but kind of looks like something out of Dr. Seuss, to be honest. Uh, but they're, they're, just, they're just so stupendous. Okay, so I want to say something about the roads there. Uh, in the major cities, the roads are paved. They look just like here. When you get out of the cities, a lot of the roads are just dirt. If it's a really major road like this, this road I think goes something like 3,000 miles, uh, you will see some pavement, but you'll notice it's only the width of one vehicle. So uh, these roads are not well traveled, but if you run across another vehicle, what happens is you pull to the side and keep two wheels on the pavement and two in the dirt, and then the vehicle coming towards you does the same thing. So everybody gets to keep two, two tires on the pavement. So you might ask, well, why don't they just pave two lanes like we do here? And the reason is because they have a country the size of ours, but only 25 million people, they just don't have the tax base. So it's costly to lay pavement down. They just don't have the money to, to fully pave the roads. This is the most Australian thing I saw in the entire trip. So I had to include it. If you drink and drive, you're a bloody idiot. Sponsored by the Western Aranda football team. This is just so Australian. If you've ever been there, you'll, you'll know what that means. Okay, and then the last day in Alex Springs, we actually took a bus ride for uh, four hours to get to Uluru, which isn't actually in Alice Springs, like a lot of people think, it's west of Alice Springs. This is one of the most well-known sites in Australia, and it's a very sacred site for the Aboriginal people. Uh, people used to climb it and fall off to their deaths, and there was uh, a lot of conflict because as a sacred site, it shouldn't be climbed. And finally, this past year, they did pass a law banning all climbing. So normally, when you see pictures of this, it's in a, a red desert. Well, as I mentioned, it was pouring, pouring, pouring rain. It was pouring rain almost the whole day we were there. And everything looks lush here. So what happens is biologists were out all over the place because the last time things bloomed here was 30, 40, 50 years ago. So there are plants that they're seeing now that nobody ever cataloged before because it had been so long since it had been so wet there. So we, we spent the day various sites on the way there, walking around the base, and it was pouring rain. And the last, last part of the day is they have this barbecue dinner for you, and it sort of comes down off the side of the bus, and you sit at tables and everything. Except it was pouring rain, we weren't going to do that. So we, we sat on the bus. But the reason people come to the spot is because at sunset, that's when you get that gorgeous glowing red. We didn't think that was going to happen, but very, very oddly, five minutes to sunset, all of a sudden it stopped raining, the sun came out, it lit Uluru up, and this magnificent rainbow came out right over it. In fact, the only thing that's wrong is this stupid little tree here, which wasn't, which wasn't in the way, but so for five minutes, we took a ton of pictures, marveled at how beautiful it was, and then it started raining again and didn't let up for the rest of the uh, evening. So we, we were very, very lucky to be there just at that moment. Okay, so two things that were missing in the Alice Springs area were kangaroos and cockatiels. And there were supposed to be a lot of cockatiels there. And I was tremendously disappointed because that was my number one target species. I've lived with cocktails most of my life, and that was something I really didn't want to leave Australia without seeing. And we thought we'd see them in Alice Springs, but we didn't. So 
we flew to Brisbane and then back out to Southwest Queensland to a place called Bowra. It's actually a wildlife sanctuary and research station. And it's one of the premier birding places because there's, uh, there's a small lake there and there's just very favorable habitat. So it's one of the places that birders go when they visit Australia. So we get there and uh, we stayed in the nearby town and immediately went there and first bird I saw was cocktail. So at that point, it didn't really matter what else I saw for the rest of the trip because I saw my cocktails. And it's just really cool because um, I'm sure some of you must have cockatiels. These uh, cocktails in the wild are all normal gray. So males have yellow heads, females have gray heads, both have orange cheeks. And what's really cool about seeing uh, cockatiels or parrots in the wild is they behave exactly like they do in your house. You're not going to go in the wild and see a dog or cat because they're domesticated versions of wild animals. But our parrots are wild birds. And the more you can know about the more you know about how they act in the wild, the better you can understand how they act in your home. And you see them doing all the same things, except these are wild birds, which is just so wonderful. So there are three females, another female. So the fe wild females, or the normal gray females have bars on their, the underside of their tail and their wings, which you'll see. The males don't have that. So wild cocktails, you can always tell male versus female. And there's a beautiful male. Uh, we, we had sun briefly one day. <laughs> so whenever he got sun, he tried to take as many photos as possible. And they're just so, such handsome birds. Cocktails are my favorite birds. So it was very windy. So all these little crests were going off to the side. And if you don't know, cockatiels are cockatoos. They're the smallest of the cockatoos. And all the cockatoos have crests. Grooming. I, it, it's like watching my birds at home. They're doing all of the exact same behaviors. Including, again, being September, we saw a lot of mating going on. When you're driving down the roads, a lot of times you would see uh, cockatiels, other parrots sitting on these barbed wire fences that are everywhere. And it's really hard to get photos and videos of them flying because they, they fly like 30 miles an hour. So I had sort of one good shot. I couldn't get any good video because they were just gone in an instant. And you never knew when they were going to be flying. So male on the right, female on the left. Started raining, so started getting a lot of wet birds. You saw the puffing up. You can see how windy it was. I mean, all I have to do is look to my left and I'll see the exact same thing that I'm seeing on the screen. Cocktails tend to be in the drier areas, so more in the interior of Australia. Okay, so there's a little story here with these three birds, and you'll see some video. So we have the male here and two females. I don't know if he was just a single guy looking for female or if he's flirting with everybody, because usually cockatiels are monogamous, but he decided he was going to flirt with this lady here, and then later this lady. And she was having none of it. So he's, and you'll hear, it's, it's a little hard to hear, but in the video clip, you'll actually hear him singing, uh, sounding just like our birds. So he would approach her and she would basically just say, no, back off. And here you can see the beautiful bars under the wings. So watch this. He keeps coming down. He's like, hey, pretty lady. And she says, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> and he keeps trying. He doesn't give up. No. 
Christmas. No. <laughs> and you can start to hear him singing. It gets to the point where all he has to do is look at her and she says no. <laughs> but he doesn't give up. So she backs off. He's coming towards her. The birds and the bees. And she's like, get out of here. And I, I've seen the same behavior in my house, so it, it, it's just so familiar. And he never stops pitching. So now he starts looking at this lady down here. He's like, at this point, I'll take anybody. I don't care. At this point, he finally gave up and actually flew to a tree next to us and started courting all the females in that tree. So this was so fun to watch. All right, now I, I follow this guy, this lady walking around eating. And as I said, this, this is a lot of greenery now. A lot of times there's not as much greenery. But it's such a joy watching them because this is what they actually eat in the wild. They're not eating dried dried out seeds that aren't even native to Australia. What they're eating is, is young shoots and probably fresh seeds that are in there and even digging in the ground and digging up these little corms. So this is why sprouting is so good, good for your birds or if you give them wheat grass or grow a chia pet because this is what they actually eat in the wild. And the other thing is you know, most, most if not all the parrots in Australia, they walk on the ground quite a bit and that's where they eat. So if you have any Australian birds, you know they like to spend time on the ground. They're not, they're not up in the trees eating like the South American birds. So it's really important to know something about where your bird comes from and you'll understand how they eat and what they eat. So if any of you have any grills on the bottom of your cage and you have a, an Australian bird, you might want to consider removing the grill if you can, which is what I, I've done for all my birds because they do want to go down there and it's natural for them. And if you keep them from going down to the bottom of the cage, it can be very frustrating for them because they're not that far removed from the wild and they still have all their natural wild instincts. I keep, um, just, tree, sorry? I keep tree poles down there for my cockatiels and extra water bowls and a ladder and they go up and down a lot. So they eat from the bottom and the top. Excellent, excellent. I know people always say, well, if they go down there, they'll walk and poop. Well, maybe they will, usually they don't. I mean, in the wild, they're not trudging through their own poop, so. Mm -hmm. But that's a natural behavior for them. Right, I had read that, so that's why I keep bowls on the bottom for food too. Yes. And I just, I just love taking videos of wild parrots doing natural behaviors like this, eating. Because you can learn so much if you watch parrots in the wild, and it really help you understand your own birds a lot better. I said the Australian parrots, they just love to graze. They walk and graze and walk and graze. Mm -hmm. Okay, these were the first sulfur crested cockatoos we saw on the trip, and they're sort of iconic in Australia. They're known for being very brazen and cheeky and stealing things and uh, being just very tame and bold birds and kind of everywhere. Oh, and more galahs. So there are a lot of galah pictures because I just kind of had to. Uh, here you can see what the beautiful crest looks like. That's a youngster. This is exactly what Rosie looks like when she grooms. The galahs are a little more skittish than some of the other cockatoos, but you can still get fairly close. Yeah. And I just love this. When you, you're walking around, you, these little heads pop up, all different kinds of cockatoo heads. They'll just keep popping up out of the greenery. Oh, here are two males. It's so beautiful. You see them a lot chewing on wood in the wild. 
uh, probably for the same reasons they chew on wood in our houses. It keeps the beak sharp. It's it's fun. It's something to do. Uh, but it's a very natural wild behavior. Obviously, they're not eating it, so it's not serving the purposes of food or shelter or reproduction. They're just doing it because they like to do it. And there's a female walking. And, well, here you can see the beautiful underwings. I wanted to, people to see that. And here she is just, she's so excited. I mean, think about that. You're, you're in a field and everything is food to you. It will be, I don't know, like <laughs> walking to a room made of chocolate or something and just, you can literally eat every single thing in there. So uh, this must be very exciting. You just walk around, there's just food everywhere. You know, we're used to seeing like one parrot or a couple of parrots or something. And then you get there and they're just flocks of parrots. These so cockatoos in general are flock birds. Uh, other parrots like macaws aren't. Uh, they may gather on a, uh, a mud cliff in South America, but macaws in general just stay with their, their own family, just their mate and if there are any juveniles. But the cockatoos in general are just, they're always around in flocks. And it's such a joy to see. Okay, these are little corellas. There are three types of corellas in Australia, the little, the long-billed, and the western. We didn't see the western because we weren't in that area. The corellas are probably, they, they always seem to be having the most fun. I mean, they're, they're always hanging and swinging and screaming. And again, it doesn't serve any basic function. It just they just seem to be having so much fun all the time. Of course, it started raining then, so it got dark. But they, they do this. They'll, ha they'll hang by one foot and just scream, just, just, for, the, just for the sake of doing it. Yeah, there you can see one, the one foot. And when you're watching a group of corellas, there's just so much to look at because everybody's doing something different. Like this, uh, this bird wants to chew on wood. This one wants to get its head uh, uh, scratched. <laughs> it's just doing its best to say, scratch my head. And then that one starts chewing on the wood. And they can kind of destroy trees. You'll see they start, they pull branches off and just throw them on the ground for, for no purpose but fun. And now they're fighting over a stick there on the right side. And uh, I don't know why they, they strip wood, but this is just something they do, which of course doesn't endear them to, to people whose yards they descend in. And you may see a flock of 20, 50, even 100 of these birds just descend in a tree and start ripping it to shreds. Of course, you can also tell looking at these, these videos why these birds were stolen to be brought into people's homes. Okay, this is a bird that has several names, uh, most commonly known as the Major Mitchell's cockatoo, also known as the Leadbetter cockatoo, and more recently known as the Pink cockatoo. Mitchell's has fallen out of favor because he was uh, a colonial explorer, explorer who um, obviously was uh, very devastating to the Aboriginal people. Uh, lead bears is used a lot. Uh, that was actually an ornithologist who described the bird. Pink cockatoo to me doesn't make a lot of sense because the bird is actually salmon colored. And if you say pink cockatoo, you're gonna think of the glaw, not of this bird, but that's what they're starting to use more often. Yeah, so again, they're also out there. Here's not a great shot, but you can see the very bright salmon 
underwings. In fact, the first one I saw in Australia, we were actually in an airport and something just flew quickly overhead and I caught this, saw this huge swath of salmon and I knew what it was. They're about the same size as a galah. They all seem to be eating the same stuff, all the cockatoos. And a lot of times you'll see mixed flocks, so there'll be there'll be galahs in there too. You, you may see several types of cockatoos all together. And these guys are most famous for their brilliant crest, which you'll see in a bit. So there was this group and they flew across the road and we followed them and they, they weren't bothered by us at all. In fact, we kind of wanted them to fly so we could get some video flying. And they, they were so unbothered by us, they, they couldn't be bothered to scare away from us. Uh, here you can see that salmon again down there. Just a very friendly group. The tails are dirty from the mud. In fact, it's really weird. There are a lot of white or light colored cockatoos and half the time they're, they're muddy and dirty, though obviously they, they, come, they must come clean when it rains, but it, it just seems weird to have white birds in an area where there's a lot of red mud. And this one I was watching for a while while she was grooming, uh, but she was just so pretty. I did. I don't have a great shot of the crest. If you've seen the crest, you, it's got rows of orange and yellow, but it was so windy that nobody's crest just stayed still. one video in flight. This gorgeous bird is a mulga parrot. Uh, the males and females are very different. The females are just sort of a dull olive and the males look like this. Uh, only saw a couple of them would have liked to have seen more. Okay, this is a pale-headed rosella. Australia has a bunch of different rosella species and some of them have several subspecies. But even within one species, they can look quite different. So this pale headed rosella is indeed very pale headed looking. Uh, you'll see a picture later on of another pale headed rosella from a different region that looks very different, but is still the same species. Uh, the rosellas, they're all the, they all have the exact same body type, the same face, and scallop backs. And so that's one thing it tells you it's a rosella. But other than that, they, they all have different colors. This is the red wing parrot. This is a female. So she only has a little bit of red in the, the wing, has a bright blue, bright blue butt. And this is a juvenile male. Uh, as an adult, this will all become solid red, but still a strikingly beautiful bird. <laughs> Australia has one bee eater. I love bee eaters. Uh, unfortunately, I, I didn't have good life for this bird, but I had to include him because I actually watched him catch a bee. So I thought that was <laughs> very cool to actually see a bird do what it's named after. All right, I have to say a word about the flies. Anyone who's been to Australia knows what I'm talking about. It, there are so many flies. This is nothing. He has, I don't know, maybe a hundred on his back. You can end up at such a point that you can't even see the shirt because you're covered with these flies. Constant buzzing. If you watch any videos out of Australia, you always hear this buzzing in the background because they're everywhere. They don't bite, but they do something that's arguably even more annoying. They want liquid. So they, if you open your mouth, they'll fly in your mouth. They'll fly up your nose. And the worst is that they go to the corners of your eyes and try to lick the liquid out of your eyes. It's, 
it gets to be just horrendous between that and the constant noise. So in areas that were thick with flies, we actually wore these hoods. It doesn't stop the buzzing, but it does keep them from getting into your eyes and nose and mouth. So it's, you, you have to do this in Australia because it's just awful with the flies. Okay, so you're probably wondering why there's a camel on the screen. Well, back in the 1800s, they brought camels into Australia, sort of a failed experiment, and then the camels multiplied. And right now there are about three quarters of a million camels in Australia, which is more than any place else in the world, including the, especially the Middle East. Uh, some of them are captive like this one, but there are also just thousands and thousands of wild camels roaming the outback. Uh, so we didn't know this, so we were kind of shocked when we, in the middle of nowhere, we came across this camel. And we finally see, saw kangaroos. This is a cemetery, and those are all artificial flowers, but I mean, you can't go to Australia and not see kangaroos. So uh, here's a young one and uh, the adult. There are different species of kangaroos as well. Uh, I never quite got used to looking at an animal and seeing a face coming out of it. Uh, this is what marsupials are like. To me, it looked like something out of Alien. It's just so weird to see these faces sticking out. Uh, all the mammals in Australia are marsupials, with the exception of uh, rats and bats. So that means they have their young, uh, they're not fully formed, and they basically then carry them in the, the females carry them in a pouch till the animal matures. Uh, and it was so beautiful out in Bower, there, there are no lights, there's nothing out there. So the sky was crystal clear. You could see the Milky Way completely clearly and just saw the most beautiful uh, moon rises there. Okay, then we flew back to um, Brisbane and a couple uh, hours south of Brisbane, we went to O'Reilly's Rainforest Retreat which is part of Lamington National Park. And as you can tell from the name, it's all rainforest there. So very different habitat, different birds. O'Reilly's is one of the premier birding places in the country. And it's, it's just an incredible place. It's beautiful. The accommodations are gorgeous. It's on a mountain. Uh, food is fabulous. They have feeding stations and all these wild birds come in to feed. They have glowworm grotto that you can go to after dark and see it all lit up by glowworms. They have a botanical garden with very ancient plants in there, which is delightful. There's a treetop walk. Uh, there's just so much to do there. I mean, you could literally spend weeks there and never get bored. Unfortunately, we, we didn't have that long to stay there, but it was absolutely delightful. Uh, here's some more sulfur crusteds. So uh, one of the key birds there is the crimson rosella, which is just one of the prettiest birds in the world, in my opinion. They have the cutest little faces. And these are um, uh, red-browed finches. It looks almost like they have wax, very pretty little birds. They're eating seed that's kind of fallen down, and you'll see in a minute how we fed them. <laughs> We spent hours there feeding the birds. I mean, really, does it get more gorgeous than that? That's my friend Chris, and they would just, they'd land on your hands, on your heads. I mean, you can't not smile. Even you know, those of us, you know, Chris and I have had parrots for years and we're used to holding parrots, but really when a wild parrot just flies in and lands on you, it's just, the feeling is indescribable. I mean, look at that face. Look, the Rosellas all have the most beautiful little faces. They have an adorable little sound too. I love their sound. Yeah. Yes. And there I am feeding one. And I had to kiss it. <laughs> they don't care, but I had to kiss the backs, kiss them and smell them and everything. Um, it's just, I, I mean, this, these are wild birds. It's just incredible. <laughs> I 
I mean, just imagine this thing, all these crimson rosellas there on the ground. They, uh, among the restaurants, there's a little outdoor cafe and all the birds come in to eat with you too. And not just the parrots, I mean, pretty much everything. All these wild birds are all different kinds who just come in and join you at the table. Here's one eating butter, which it really shouldn't be doing. Oh, and there's one with an almond. Oh, and of course, and I don't know what, you may or may not know this, but parrots are the only birds that will take food in their hands and bring it up to their mouths. Other birds will hold food, but on the ground or a branch. So parrots are really unique in that way. And interestingly, this bird isn't eating the bread, it's eating the butter. So they really have terrible diets. But you know, they're wild birds, what are you gonna do? Okay, king parrots. There are several species of king parrots. Australia only has one, the Australian king parrot. This is a female, and this is the beautiful male. Just stunningly beautiful birds, both of them. You were supposed to feed them from these, these dishes, but uh, they didn't care. They just landed all over you. And so a lot of times you just held the seat in your hand like this. And of course, being parrots, they have absolutely no concept of personal space. I love the way his the, his tail moved as he squeaked it. It reminded me of a, a, like a, a, a pump handle. You press it and go like squeak, squeak, squeak. I love these little finches too. They're so pretty. Okay, so this is a um, Regent Bowerbird. This is the bird that's actually uh, the flagship for O'Reilly's and it's on all there. Uh, their signs and literature and everything. Absolutely stunning bird. Wouldn't feed from your hand, but came pretty close. And at one point, uh, I was actually, I got some raisins off the, the breakfast bar. Uh, which I knew raisins were okay for them, and I was tossing them raisins, which they would take. Just stunning bird. And this is the satin bower bird who actually is nicking a french fry here. This is a bird that was made famous by David Attenborough in Life of Birds for building the bowers. Uh, if you remember, that was one of his original series, and he showed how they would build these. Uh, they would collect things then, then do this little dance and try to attract the females. Uh, a little, it seemed a little bit oh, undignified for it to be swapping a, uh, uh, getting a um, French fry, but what are you going to do? It has these beautiful, bright purple eyes. This is the male, the female has completely different colors. And while we were out hiking, we actually ran across one of these famous blue bowers. Interestingly, the, the blue plastic is almost all identical in color, very little variation, but we're very excited to find this. And this is exactly the kind of thing that David Attenborough showed. And back when we were at Bower Station, we actually found another uh, bower. We have no idea who made it, but a bird had, um, there was a local construction site with lots of um, screws and bolts and things like that. It, it stole hundreds of them and brought it and made a bower of all these shiny chrome uh, nuts and bolts and things. So we would have loved to have known who did that one. Now this is also a patty melon that I mentioned earlier, but this is patty melon the animal. It's a small marsupial, probably comes up to your knee, and it's just a cute little thing. And at sunset, they're just roaming around. Again, not afraid of you, you can walk right up to them. Sort of like little tiny mini kangaroos. 
Okay, on the way back to Brisbane, we stopped at the Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary. And as it says, it's a sanctuary for koalas, but also all kinds of native wildlife. So there's uh, captive wildlife there, and then there's wildlife that just sort of appears. It started pouring rain again. Uh, they have a feeding station set up for the lorikeets, these rainbow lorikeets, and you, you can hold or place them in a holder, these white containers that filled with nectar. You can see how hard it's raining there. So these are rainbows. And these are scaled lorikeets who, uh, I know may have but they always look like they want to kill you. <laughs> you look at them, I mean, this is what they, they look at you like this, like, you know, go ahead, make my day. And uh, here's another one just get, kind of giving me the evil eye. Um, this is a brush turkey. So uh, not related to our turkeys at all. It's what's called a megapode. It's a group of birds that they don't actually incubate their eggs or sit on, they don't sit on their eggs. What they do is they bury the eggs under mounds of vegetation. And then the male hangs out nearby and he adjusts it. So he may take some leaves and stuff away or he may add to it. He's trying to keep the eggs at a certain temperature. And when they actually hatch, the birds come out, they're precocial, which means that they're they're fe fully feathered, they can feed themselves, they can run, they can do whatever they want. But uh, it's very interesting because there's no direct incubation. And this is probably the best known of the megapode birds. They don't eat them, by the way, like our turkeys. Uh, so this is gonna be a little loud, but this is, this is lorikeets. <laughs> Again, these are completely wild birds that just fly in. And they're just seeing some apple on the ground. I just love the way, you'll see how the lorikeets hop. This brush turkey. And pigeons. So, I want to give you an idea of scale because this is going to be important later. So a rainbow lorikeet is um, about the size of uh, oh, a blue jay or a stellar's jay, um, uh, probably uh, about the size of a Quaker parrot. Uh, brush turkey, as you can see, is quite a bit larger. It's not as big as our wild turkeys, but, but close to it, not that far off size. This is a kangaroo paddock they had there. These guys are captive. I don't really know why, but um, they just sort of lie around there. And you can feed them. They have, they have kangaroo pellets you can give them. And they're very, very gentle. They, they'll put their little paws on you and nibble, but they never bite you or anything. They're, they're just very gentle birds. You can see how wet they are. And this is a wallaby, I don't remember which one, which is again, like a miniature kangaroo and I'm feeding it. But what I really wanted to feed was the emu. I love emus, we'd seen them in the wild and I'm just fascinated by them. They're such huge, cool birds. So I got some pellets and I was feeding it. I mean, you can just look at the look on his face like, oh my God, oh my God, there's some, some food there. And this is the photo I most wanted probably the whole trip. You know, the, the shot of the emu looking directly in the camera because I just think they're the, the coolest birds. Uh, emus actually, the females lay the eggs and I guess incubate them. When they hatch, the female disappears and she said, she's like, I'm done. The males actually raise them. So when you see an emu walking around with chicks, which we saw quite a bit of, it's always gonna be a male. The females go off, so uh, very different from most birds. And one of the reasons we went there is because you have the opportunity to hold a koala, which we very much wanted to do. And they're surprisingly heavy. It's like a bowling ball. They're really like hard and solid and heavy, which was quite the surprise, but obviously still quite a delight to hold one. You can see I'm a little bit happy there. 
Okay, so then we, we flew up to Cairns, and which is most famous for the barrier, the Great Barrier Reef, and we did spend a day snorkeling. Uh, I, I didn't include any pictures of that. There weren't any parrots for that part of the trip. But then we went north of Cairns to Cassowary Lodge, which as the name implies is where you can see cassowaries. Cassowaries are very, very difficult to run, ac run across in the wild. And this is one of the few places you can go where you have a pretty decent chance of seeing them. These are wild cassowaries, uh, which are these huge prehistoric birds, probably another 50% larger than an emu. And, but they tend to, they're on this land and the couple that owns the place, in fact, there's a kitchen down here. She puts out like watermelons and things like that for them. So they do tend to swing by fairly often looking for handouts. Uh, she used to keep this door open here into her kitchen, but then one day she was at the counter preparing some food and a cassowary, cassowary walked in and was right next to her. So she now keeps it locked. Well, why are you even concerned? Well, cassowaries are known for sort of one thing, which is killing, uh, killing other animals, including humans. Uh, I think only a couple people have been killed, but they have this reputation that they will attack you and disembowel you. They do do that regularly to dogs. They really, really hate dogs. So this couple actually has some dogs and every time the dogs have to do their business, they literally have to drive them off the property every single time because you can't let the dogs out or the cassowaries will kill them. Now, this is where I want you to see this picture and the next, but oh, so we're up here upstairs and you ha we actually stayed here for a night. Uh, birders come in from around the world because the, if they want to check off cassowary on their bird list, this is the place to come. So upstairs, they actually have bird feeding stations with all kinds of lots of cool birds coming. But the people there, maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 people, they're from every part of the world trying to see the cassowaries. And we're up here because it's safe up here. We don't want to be down here with them. So this is giving you an idea. You remember that brush turkey and the little, little um, rainbow lorikeet? And here's the thing that's the size of one of our turkeys. Now you can see how big the cassowary is. Uh, they're basically five to six feet tall and they're, they're just enormous. Uh, the, I think the only bird bigger than them is the ostrich. Um, and they're just wildly colored and they have these big casks on their head. Um, which are made of keratin, and nobody knows what they're for. They've never figured out, because both the males and females have it, so they don't think it's for mating, but they really don't know. And they have these, this brilliantly colored skin. Here's a close-up of the foot, and the foot is enormous. This here, that's the killing piece. This is the, the killing toe. If they charge you, they will reach, they'll lift it up, and they'll hook this into the animal and just rip down and just literally rip you open and disembowel you. Uh, this is being done not to eat you. They don't eat uh, animals. I think they're just totally vegetarian. This is doing, this is as defense. So after, you know, we spent quite a bit of time up there and the cassowaries had moved off and gone somewhere. And so we went down, I went, well, I guess we, we all kind of went for a walk on the property, we're walking around. Uh, it's, a very, it's a beautiful property. And so I'm standing there and all of a sudden the cassowaries came back. So, and now I'm on the same ground as them. So I stood completely still because I'm like, well, this is not a good thing. <laughs> of course I was taking pictures and they're walking by. So I'm very close to them now, maybe, I don't know, seven or eight feet away at most. And they go past me and they're walking down Oh, and that was the first one. The second one came along. I want you to see these beautiful long eyelashes on them. I mean, and the skin, it's just gorgeous. And then all of a sudden, this one found, figured out I was there and just turned and looked at me. And let me tell you, being stared in the eyes by a cassowary is not a good feeling. It's, it's amazing that I didn't uh, wet the ground at this point because it just stood and it stared at me. I'm like, Oh crap, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap. But I stayed perfectly still. I got the picture and stayed perfectly still. And then the bird turned and, and walked on. But 
let me tell you, this is, this is a scary sight. And if this doesn't look like a dinosaur, I don't know what does. And I did actually walk up a little bit behind him so you can see. The hair is fairly coarse. Or it's just, it's not hair, it's actually feathers. Um, because they did actually have some feathers they had us touch. I mean, this is such a bizarre looking bird. Oh, one more shot. Okay, so next we went to the Atherton Tablelands, which is southwest of Cairns. Um, this is sort of the breadbasket for the country. Uh, it's where all the agriculture is and they grow all the fruits and vegetables because it's very lush and rolling hills and just absolutely beautiful. It's probably the most beautiful place. Um, it's just really comfortable to stay there. We actually, we saw a platypus there. there there's a pond that had some platypus, uh, platypi, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't have any good pictures because uh, they're mostly under the water, so you don't see a lot, but we were lucky that we did get see them. So one of the key birds we wanted to find was called the double-eyed fig parrot. This is not it. This is a fig bird, and this is a fig tree, and these are little figs. Uh, so we had actually set aside a whole day to see the fig parrot because they're very hard to find, and we didn't have high hopes of success but they thought maybe we might be able to find some in this area we're in. So when I saw the fig bird in the fig tree, I asked our guide, well, are we gonna find the fig parrots there? And in his usual condescending way, he was like, oh no, Amy, that's ridiculous. Just because it's called a fig parrot doesn't mean you gotta look in a fig tree and find the fig parrot. And he was just kind of poo-pooing the whole thing. Well, about 10 seconds later, this is what I saw in the fig tree. And that is indeed a double-eyed fig parrot. Uh, fig parrots are the smallest of the parrots. I think there are a couple of fig parrots that are smaller than this one, but they're very small parrots and just absolutely cute. So when I pointed out to him, immediately he was very angry and then he ran off to find Chris who was somewhere else. So um, see, he really didn't want me to be right about it, but what are you gonna do? I mean, just look at that face. And then he and a female flew to the tree immediately next to me. I mean, I was probably no more than two feet away from this bird. And it was perfect because then I got really great contrast. I mean, it's hard to believe this is even a parrot. It's so tiny. And so this, this clown coloration. And if I thought Roselle was so cute, I mean, this, this is like off the chart cuteness. And this is the female who's almost as brightly colored. And they were sort of walking on the tree the way, almost the way nuthatches do, face down. So at that point, it was great because we had the whole rest of the day to do all kinds of other things because we had found the target bird within uh, about 15 minutes. So we went off to find uh, red-tailed black cockatoos. Now, even though the name says black cockatoo, black is not an adjective. The name is actually black dash cockatoo. So it's, it's sort of like one word. And there are um, four or five species of them. The only one we got to see was the red-tailed black, unfortunately, but stunning birds. And these, these birds are huge. They're about two feet long. So um, they're absolutely huge birds. And the males and females look very different. We went to a place, uh, there, there was a peanut farmer, so it was private land. And they hate the cockatoos when the peanuts are growing because the cockatoos will eat them. But after the peanuts are harvested, they love the cockatoos because the cockatoos will just clean up all the debris that's left. So by the time the cockatoos are done, the field looks great. So they don't have to do the work. So it's kind of a love hate, but this guy really, he was very appreciative of cockatoos. So these are, uh, I'll show you females and males side by side. These are females and that's a male. And this picture really shows the difference. So females have these gorgeous gold speckles all over their body. The males don't. Females have a light beak. The male has a darker beak. 
the females have these striped tails, oranges and yellow stripes. The males have one big red blotch across the tail. So very, very easy to tell apart. Even the eye rings are a little different, but you don't need that when you have everything else. And there's a female walking. Female to male, the crest on these guys goes all the way forward. This male. I've got a bunch of little videos because there were so many of them and the noise level's unbelievable. What was interesting is the, this red ground where the peanuts were, it shimmered the way pavement does on a hot day. So at the end of the first day, and we'd both taken hundreds and hundreds of photos and videos, only a few were usable because when we looked at them, everything had this shimmer to it. So the second day we went back and took more pictures and trees because those were easier. But um, you can see here this big red flare. And then here's the female. And then the trees, we love when they flare the tails because then you, you see all that color. So this video kept in because you can see that shimmer that just permeated everything. It was really odd because it's not like it was very, it wasn't very hot, but there must have been a big disparity between the temperature of the ground and the air. And this farmer had a house right there. And honestly, I don't know how he put up with the noise. If you think living with one cockatoo is loud, imagine a couple hundred of them. And sometimes they would just fill the trees. And just seeing all these flying parrots is just incredible. it is about parrots. I don't know why they have to scream when they're flying. They have to scream while they're eating. Uh, I don't know any other bird that is just so noisy. Uh, now, I, I don't know if you can see me on the screen or not, or just a video, but uh, the farmer actually gave us some feathers to take. I just want to show these two so you can see the size. So these are two female tail feathers. You can see they're, they're just huge and gorgeous. And here's a male tail feather, so you can really see the difference. And this is a, uh, these two are flight feathers. So they're solid black. And these are all tail feathers. And actually, and here's a sulfur crested feather, which you can see how much smaller it is. Okay, and then another place we went to, uh, sort of a park. This is, remember I told you there was another pale-headed rosella. Well, this is it. You can see this one is so much more brightly colored than the other one. This one's colors were brilliant, where the other one really was pale, but exactly the same bird. And you can see it's red under fluffies right here, which are really pretty. I said all the Rosellas have scalloped backs. It's a beautiful bird. 
okay, so this guy is here. This is called a frilled lizard. Those of you who remember Jura the original Jurassic Park, remember uh, when the guy who plays Newman on Seinfeld later on in the movie, there were all these cute little dinosaurs, and he's uh, he starts, I don't remember, kicking them or something. They He makes them angry and because they were acting all cute. And then all of a sudden, they're, they're, uh, their skin flared down. They start screaming and spitting venom, but they, and then they, they ate him. Well, they're actually patterned on this guy, the frilled lizard. And if you see this whole frill here, I didn't get to see him angry. Um, and they don't spit venomous fluid like the dinosaurs did. But otherwise, they look pretty much identical. This, uh, this skin will just shoot out on both sides and make these enormous frills. Big lizard. I mean, I couldn't even get them all in one picture, but I thought that was really cool. The other thing this park had are rock wallabies. These are wild uh, animals, but they'll come in and they'll feed. They're very small and very gentle, and they, they'll give you these uh, pellets for them. And they'll step on you, and they have the softest little paws, and so gentle, so gentle. So they're very nice little animals. We found out that there's a one of the biggest bat sanctuaries in the country was nearby. So Chris and I decided to go spend a few hours there. This is a little bat. I don't remember what kind. In the U.S., all our bats are small like this. In Australia, a small bat like this is called a micro bat because all the other bats are these things. They're macro bats. In this case, these are flying foxes. And all the, the ones that are here are unreleasable. And they really have a hard time in Australia between a lot of times the heat waves will kill thousands of them or uh, rain or flooding, habitat destruction. And another way that a lot of them get injured is their barbed wire fences everywhere and their wings will catch and they'll actually get stuck. So the bat hospitals will get calls all the time that there's a bat stuck on a fence somewhere and then you know, they may or may not be releasable depending on how much damage there is to the wing, but they're really wonderful, sweet animals. And you see them eating fruit, but they don't actually eat the fruit. What they do is they squeeze the fruit and suck out all the nectar and drop the fruit. And then the dropped fruit is eaten by other animals. So they're a very vital part of the ecosystem. They're so adorable. These bottles have nectars in, nectar in there. This one's doing its little Dracula pose. They actually sleep by folding their wings over them, uh, just like in Dracula. All right, then we flew down to South Australia and we traveled to South Australia and Victoria. We went to Adelaide, so saw a lot of rainbow lorikeets down there. While we were there, um, sometimes, well, we got totally rained out of some of the place we were going, but uh, the rains were so bad, they knocked out all the transformers and the entire state of South Australia was dark for two days. So it was cold and we had no heat or power. So at times it got to be a little bit trying. And again, like the cockatoos, um, the parrots are all just uh, grazing, grazing in the grass. This pretty little bird is the Eastern Rosella. I think it's one of the prettiest of the Rosellas because it's got blue and green and yellow and red and white. And it's just a stunning bird. This is a juvenile here on the left, adult on the right. And again, you see the pretty scalloped back. This is a, one of the subspecies of the crimson rosella. This is the Adelaide rosella. It's only found in a very tiny area and it's bright orange instead of red. And this is the yellow rosella, also found in a very narrow range. And it's another subspecies of the crimson rosella. So you can see at times it can be difficult to figure out what rosella you're looking at. Because if you go just by color, uh, there's such wide variation in so many subspecies, it can be difficult. All right, so here's uh, one more lorikeet, the musk lorikeet, very pretty bird. Uh, they're investigating a nest hollowing. See that adorable little tail. 
a beautiful little parrot, a little orange on its beak. And I, I believe the males and females look identical, so we can't tell. This is the red rump parrot, very common little parrot. You don't normally or easily see the red rump. So most of the time, it's, I mean, it's, it's blue and green and yellow. You'd think that this would be incredibly uh, outstanding bird. And it certainly would be here, but they spend all their time down in the grass and they blend in so much that people just don't notice them. And for any birders, this is the equivalent of little brown job. It's hard to imagine that this brightly colored bird is overlooked, but people just don't notice them because they blend into the grass. I was lucky enough to find some in the trees to photograph. And so you don't normally see that bright red rump when they're walking around. These parrots are called blue bonnets, and they also vary widely in color. This is a juvenile here. I don't have any great pictures, but the adult has more blue in the face and the juvenile is a little bit more ragged. And they can have a lot of variety in the reds and the yellows and all that. This is a region parrot. They're uncommon, hard to find, but we stumbled across a whole flock of them, fortunately. Uh, this is a female. And this is the male, so a bright chartreuse yellow. And you can see how long their tails are here. They're probably about 16 inches from here to here. Again, just eating everything on the ground. None of these birds are afraid. It's so remarkable. It's not like here where the birds are so skittish. There, the birds are like, yeah, whatever. Uh, okay, so this is the other ring neck that we saw. This is the Mali ring neck. Mali being a sort of type of scrubby brush that's in the southern part of Australia. But same species as the Port Lincoln. I just love this bird. It's so pretty. not at all afraid of us. I was practically on top of him. I just love the way they eat. Okay, uh, I mentioned the long bill crow before, that's this bird, and they do indeed have a long bill. But uh, our guide described the best way to tell them apart from the little Corella, because you may or may not have much red up here. This one's very red, but they always have this red slash. He said, picture if you took a knife and dragged it across their throat and they're bleeding. Not a great way to describe it, but, but you do remember it. So if you see a red slash across the throat, it's a long build, not a little Corella. And here we have synchronized grooming, clean on the left, dirty on the right. Here you can really see that long bill. Here's a little Corella at a nest hole. And one of the biggest problems facing parrots is uh, the Australian parrots all nest in nest holes. They don't create them, so um, they either form over the years or another bird excavates them. But when you cut down these trees, they, you lose a nest. 
And even if a company, say they harvest wood and then they plant new trees, it takes about a hundred years for these nest holes to develop. So if you cut down trees and the birds have no place to nest, then you don't have more birds. And that's one of the biggest uh, factors affecting parrot reproduction in Australia. So he's checking us out to make sure we're not predators. Up oh, some more galahs. Obviously, they're very photogenic. And here's a sulfur crested. This is obviously a nest hole too. So he was coming in and then he realized we were there. And he's checking us out. And I say he because he is a dark eye. And I found if I looked really closely, I could pick out some koalas from the tops of trees. You basically just see this sort of gray blob up there. And if you kind of tune your eye, you can sort of pick them out, which is cool. These are all wild koalas. Okay, and then the last section we went to is the Grampians, also down south. This is an area that's more up in the mountains, so you have different kinds of birds, different habitat. So we stayed at a place called Kookaburra Lodge and every room has a back patio, its own back patio. So you walk out back and you see this. It's all these sulfur crested cockatoos and they're waiting for you because they know people have food. So they basically mug you for food. So you notice here everyone has a cracker because we had crackers and Obviously, it's not good for them, but you know, you're standing there and they're all staring at you. What are you going to do? So, just like the parrots in our home, you have to give them something. You know, and they're again, these are wild birds, but they're very well trained that humans have food. Uh, this is a kangaroo paddock that was behind us. This guy is huge, absolutely huge bruiser. So, he would land on you. And then he'd get really aggressive. And if you tried to feed anyone else, he would bite your ear. And you would have to keep the food coming to him or he would, uh, you know, as rapidly as he wanted, or he'd bite your ear. So uh, he was, you know, again, we're used to cockatoos. Both of us have cockatoos, so it, it didn't particularly scare us. I can imagine if you were just some person who didn't know parrots that this would probably be very frightening to have this large bird land on you and stop, start biting you. We're obviously quite used to this. Oops. It's just crazy to think that a wild bird would just land in you and do this. Whoops. Doing selfie. And you'd walk out and then you'd look, turn back to your room and you look up on the roof and they're lined up on the roof also looking down on you. It was like a scene from the birds. And then when you're inside, they, they all line up and they stare at you and they just stare in the room. You wake up in the morning, you open the curtains and there they are staring at you. Here's one trying to get in the room. If you open the door, they come up to the door. I think they probably did come in the room too, but you open the door and they're just waiting for you. So it, it's really hard not to feed them. I mean, it's, it's kind of like a gang and they're, they're kind of mugging you for food. And if you don't come out, you just, you're, you're in the room and you look over and again, you're being watched all the time. Interestingly, you know, we think of them as all white other than the yellow crest, but if you get really close, you can see there is a, a pale yellow uh, cheek, uh, just like the cockatiel. So a lot of the cockatoos do have little bit of pale, uh, another color right there around the cheek area. The chairs were up because of course it was raining. Other than 
than that one guy that most of them are actually really polite. Here they come. Other birds also came in, like that's a currawong in the back. So currawongs and magpies would actually come too, but they were they were a little bit more shy, so they wouldn't take it out of your hand. Okay, and on to when we went up in the mountains, we found one of our other target birds, which is the gang gang cockatoo, uh, which we really really want to see. And they're they're small; they're about the size of a galahs, but they have just this wacky hair. And they sound like creaking doors. And they're just the coolest birds. I mean, look at that. It's like a perpetual bad hair day. And listen to the, the sound it makes in this one. And then this is the female. So she has a gray head instead of a red head, but then she has all this striping on her chest. Looks very much like the tail feathers of the uh, red tailed black cockatoo, whereas the male is solid gray down here. Oops, there's one else. And this is what they were eating. I don't remember the name of it, but it's some kind of a nut thing. This is a favorite for the gang gangs. And as mentioned, the lodge we little, it's almost like a little motel we were staying at was called um, Kookaburra Lodge. And this is why all the kookaburras would come in. And kookaburra is obviously a very famous Australian bird and they're quite large. And they are the largest of the kingfishers. And at sunset, uh, the fellow who owned the place would bring, they're, they're meat eaters. So he would bring them meat and they would come in. There are actually several species of uh, kookaburras in Australia. This is the other fairy wren I was telling you about. This is the superb. So it only has blue up top, but also a very pretty little bird. Fairy wrens were one of the things I really wanted to see in Australia too. And these are the kangaroos behind us doing that, that classic kangaroo boxing thing. This must be a female with a joey in the pouch, but they, this is so bizarre looking. It's like this slap fight they do. And then this one actually pushed this one over. And it, Australia has this famous pink lake from Alja. Uh, it wasn't far from where we started in Adelaide, but we didn't have time to go there. I really wanted to see pink lake. And then we were driving and we came across another pink lake. So just stunningly beautiful color and off, set off by this field of canola back here, the brilliant yellow. So just so beautiful there. Okay, and then the last day we spent in Sydney because our flight were the following day. So have to put in the classic shot of the uh, Opera House. And oh, you can't have a talk about Australia without showing the Opera House and Founders Bridge. The Founders Bridge, interestingly, you can actually walk up there. They take guided tours and there are actually some people up there right here. So you start up and you walk all the way. There's some sort of walkway up to the very top, which is cool. And then the, this was the last parrot of the trip, a rainbow lorikey. I don't remember what this is called, but it's about 20 feet in the air. I only uh, took a shot of the top, but some sort of vegetation with that eating. So had to get one last parrot in. And this is again, my friend, Chris. Oh, a few of the photos and videos are hers. And uh, we went, Avian Discovery Tours is the group we went with. It was actually the very first trip they ran and um, had to finish that classic picture. And then that's it.
生をした。